Thank you. All right, good evening. I think we'll start. Thank you so much for coming. Another uh, full house, which makes me very happy. This is the sixth in our conversations that we started this semester to provide a forum where people from Providence and you know students of the university and MA students here and everyone else can get together and listen to interesting talks and engaging conversation. Uh, so for those of you who haven't uh, been here before, we have a little food and wine afterwards. Uh, and we have a little Q&A after the presentation. And uh, the speakers are, according to Brown's rules, speakers don't have to wear a mask, but everyone else should, except of course, when you eat and drink. And we also have the door open so we can gather out there afterwards. I apologize for the heat wave in this building. It's crazy. We, I think the, uh, the way it was set, it didn't anticipate the very warm temperatures during the day. And so the house heated up a little bit. So we hope we can, um, we can manage with that open door. I'm Dietrich Neumann. Uh, I'm the director of the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage. And uh, tonight is my really great and distinct pleasure to welcome two friends to the center, Yasmin Fobis and Aaron Forrest, uh, two young architects from Providence. And um, I think, you know, two of the most remarkable uh, architects in town with very, very interesting work and interesting ideas. And I'll quickly introduce them, Yasmin, is now assistant professor at Harvard uh, at the Graduate School of Design. Aaron is associate professor at the Rhode Island School of Design and they have an office together they call Ultra Modern. And Yasmin got her BA from Berkeley uh, with highest distinction I should add and an MA from Princeton and uh, also won the Rome Prize in architecture. So she spent a year at the American Academy this very long tradition in that amazing McKim Eden White building on the, on the uh, Gian Nicolo. And um, uh, of course, uh, I should, should mention she was uh, one of uh, really the first professor of practice in our architecture major that we started at Brown and we were very happy and lucky to have her. But what sometimes happens, a school up north, Harvard, <laughs> stole her away from, from us and now she's teaching there and uh, it's a totally unforgivable uh, on Harvard's <laughs> part, but uh, we're glad that you at least come back uh, tonight. And she also taught, of course, lots of experience teaching at Cooper Union and at RISTI and at Princeton. And she has worked for Stephen Hull and Guy Nordenson, the great uh, engineer and work AC. Uh, that's Amala Andraus's firm. Some of you might know her addition to the RISTI uh, administrative building when you go to New Rivers and you look across the street, there's sort of a pink lacy contraption, which you weren't involved in, I think, but the firm uh, you worked for was, and uh, Amal Andraus is the dean at, um, at Columbia and her husband did that. And Aaron uh, is, uh, got his uh, uh, bachelor in architecture of, uh, at Princeton, as well as his master of architecture and taught at RISTI at Penn and, uh, at Princeton as well. And uh, he's very active at RISTI, uh, associate professor there now chairing all kinds of committees. I don't know how you do it. The list was so long, the curriculum committee and, <laughs> and the awards I'm, committee, et cetera. I'm on sabbatical. So oh, right now you're on sabbatical. <laughs> good, good, well deserved it seems. And worked for Bernheimer Architects in, in Brooklyn, LTL, Abalos and Herreros in Madrid, not bad, fantastic uh, firm. Guy Nordenson as well in Agreste and Gandon Sonas. And um, Thomas Magazine last year, voted them among the 50 most important architecture firms, uh, best architecture firms in the world, which I think is, is uh, right on. Um, they have won a long list of awards. I'll just mention a few. The Rhode Island Monthly Design Award for the Aristi Gary. Uh, the AIA here in Rhode Island has given them an honor award, an emerit award, and a citation, and a People's Choice Award. So a, a whole reign of uh, awards here. and. They've been finalists in a lot of uh, competitions uh, here locally, the Crook Point Bridge competition. You all know that bridge that stands uh, above the Seekonk River and we are not quite sure what to do with it. So uh, I, the un, uh, uh, unified downtown public spaces, uh, Roger Williams Park Visitor Center, also the Philadelphia Contemporary Art Museum. They won uh, a competition for an affordable housing uh, duplex in, in Central Falls. And we'll you know, see more of your work, of course, in a second. And uh, the, the amazing uh, uh, Chicago Horizon Public Pavilion on the lakeshore in Chicago that I made a pilgrimage to see, and it was definitely worth it. So uh, I also realized that you actually lectured here, uh, I think it was Aaron, right, in this, uh, for this uh, institution before I came in 2019. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
we before the pandemic we used to run into each other at uh, at uh, local restaurants in particular north bakery uh, several <laughs> times so like many architects they also love good food and good restaurants and uh, on that note i would love to ask you to help me welcome Jasmine and Aaron for their lecture tonight. Here's a switcheroo here. Thank you, uh, Dietrich, for that lovely introduction. Unfortunately, North Bakery doesn't exist anymore, but it was a great spot for a very short period of time. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I forgot about the wonderful rule, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're super uh, happy to be here. Um, and uh, uh, it's just exciting to be in this room again, which is a super nice room. I um, presented a project here with Richardson Ogidan, executive director of Sasquatch Cultural Center a number of years back, which was, um, uh, we'll present again in a slightly different format, um, just because we're going to talk about a few um, Providence projects today. Um, so uh, this is obviously where we uh, are and also where our practices. We moved here to teach at RISD and start our office in uh, 2014. And what's nice, I think, about uh, working in Providence is um, we came up here from New York. So there are kind of obvious benefits in terms of having space to kind of think and breathe and um, um, kind of think about what we're doing as architects. Um, but also because it's kind of a, a small city and a small state, you have this chance to kind of have an impact um, across the city or, or at a kind of larger scale than I think is possible in, um, in some other places. So we're gonna start off by talking about actually two publications that we, um, we did in the last couple of years. Um, and we don't do a lot of uh, uh, writing in general. We do a little bit, but, but not a lot, but um, both of these kind of projects gave us an opportunity to kind of reflect on our, um, on our work together and kind of reassess what it is what we do when we design a space and how it is that we kind of um, think and work as architects in a contemporary American city and Providence in particular. Um, so the first of these is a, a project called um, Vacant Providence, which is a kind of mini survey of modern architecture in Providence, Rhode Island, that, um, focused on uh, works that kind of sprang out of um, a kind of um, abundance of vacant space and uh, kind of suboptimal uh, real estate conditions of uh, particularly of the kind of um, 60s to 90s period, um, but also continuing uh, currently. Um, and we were invited to this project for the sole uh, uh, Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism in 2019 um, because of this project, which is a pavilion we built with some students in a parking lot on the south side of uh, Providence. And the curators asked if we could kind of extrapolate from this project and talk about the kind of urbanism of the city of uh, Lake Providence. And we weren't really um, sure how much extrapolation we could really do, but we kind of appreciate a challenge. And so we, we took that on. Um, and the site for this pavilion was this space, which is this um, acre plus uh, parking lot behind uh, the Southside Cultural Center and Trinity Church. Um, they've been using for um, some uh, uh, summertime activities. And um, this so is this kind of huge parking crater right in one of the densest parts of the city um, that um, sat empty almost all the time. So this is like right in, right in Trinity Square. Um, and so this condition kind of prompted us to zoom out and look at the question of underutilized uh, land in the city as a whole. Um, and that resulted in this kind of rough map, which shows all the uh, surface parking in downtown um, in uh, 2016 when we made it. Um, and then it's kind of brought into deeper relief uh, when you map the parking against green space in the city. And there's just a lot more um, surface area devoted to cars than, than to people in the city. Um, and in the downtown as well, this kind of um, junk space has kind of supplanted the built fabric of the city. You guys are probably 
Uh, many of you familiar with this uh, propped up facade on a, um, a parking lot uh, immediately adjacent to the Providence Arcade um, that kind of bridges between uh, Westminster Street and Way Bassett, and it's just a kind of poignant indicator of this condition. Um, so the map can easily be read in this kind of negative light, and that was definitely our first reaction that like the car had just destroyed Providence. Um, but looking back at the Southlight project, we also thought about how this kind of abundance of vacant land um, really kind of presented an opportunity to um, for citizens to um, to uh, redefine the city one one lot at a time. So we have this kind of luxury of open space here. Um, and that allows for a lot of development that we're seeing, um, especially in downtown right now, um, but it also kind of um, allows the people here this freedom to kind of experiment with alternative models. Um, so not just profitable development or kind of top down planning, but um, some kind of true alternatives. Um, so we began to see each of these black polygons as an opportunity to build the city a little bit uh, differently. And we began to look for kind of recent examples um, where a piece of architecture had kind of uh, taken on one of these underutilized plots and proposed a kind of new way of inhabiting the city. And so what um, we produced was a series of 10 pamphlets, each about an individual building or design from the past 60 years. Um, and the criteria for selecting these projects were one, it had to kind of contribute as a, as a work of architecture and as an urban proposition equally, um, and to have a kind of um, ambition uh, built into it. And then another uh, criteria was that it couldn't follow a typical development model. So neither kind of commercial for-profit development nor part of a, a, a campus. So these criteria kind of led us to a, a surprising and pretty interesting group of buildings, um, some by very well-known architects, but the buildings themselves are kind of buried in their portfolios. Um, others by kind of local architects and um, artists who were kind of compelled by specific circumstances to try something a little bit different. Um, so the focus ended up being kind of primarily on the, the west and south sides of town, um, which I think is kind of fitting the, the parts of the city where the story hasn't kind of yet been completed. Um, so uh, on the screen here, you can kind of see very small the um, list of projects uh, and architects, some images as well. Um, some of these you might recognize. And so um, uh, to tie everything together, we looked also into a kind of longer um, history of uh, kind of emptiness in the city and looking back to its founding um, in the 17th century and exploring uh, how vacancy has been kind of leveraged at key moments in the city's development. And what was, um, <laughs> uh, I like that. Um, what was interesting about um, putting this together was that you kind of realize um, how much of the city's development was really driven by a demand for empty, emptiness as opposed to the kind of dense in, infill that you think of when you think of um, uh, 19th century cities in particular. So the city's economy has really been based on uh, voids of one form or another since the 18th century. Um, and huge transportations of the urban plan took place about once every hundred years from the construction of the harbor um, to the railroads, uh, to the introduction of the freeways and the scales of which um, these kind of transformations kind of outpaced uh, those of housing or, or office space. And what's interesting is each of these epics has its own little kind of uh, architectural experiment or gem. Um, and we took as our prototype the arcade, um, which kind of adapted the Greek, Greek temple um, facade to commercial use, um, filling that space between Westminster and Waybosset with a new, a very new type of program for when it was built, the, the indoor shopping mall. Um, so these are kind of uh, quick uh, animations flipping through each of the, um, uh, each of the um, buildings that we surveyed. One was actually a Plaza Cathedral Square by Ian Pei, um, much maligned, but a very kind of interesting experiment in its time in pedestrianization. Um, first Tabernacle by uh, Ira Rakitansky, um, Classical High School um, uh, by the Architects Collaborative, um, one of the very last buildings that Walter Gropius worked on. Um, uh, and then there's speculative proposals from the 80s, um, houses by artists in the 1990s, um, and then uh, some uh, new proposals, both 
um, some of them by us, some of them by other architects working right now and, and trying to kind of leverage this exact condition into, um, uh, into kind of new models of housing. Um, so that's the kind of first publication. The second is this essay that we wrote for the journal uh, Platt at Rice University uh, called Post Typical. Um, and it, um, it builds on an essay by uh, another architect named Ram Kulhaus, who uh, wrote this essay called Typical Plan, where he critiques, but also kind of valorizes the commercial high rises of uh, midtown Manhattan as spaces that are both kind of mind-numbingly generic, um, but also kind of latent with opportunity. There are these spaces that are kind of driven by economy and built on um, kind of efficient column grids and cores, essentially. Um, and we thought this might actually be a good lens through which to look at the plans of our own projects, which are often these kind of big empty rectangles that are left intentionally blank as a way of kind of opening up um, the possibilities of what might happen within. Um, so Kohlhaas kind of likens the typical plan architecture to graph paper, which I think was probably meant to be an insult, um, but we found it as a kind of exciting possibility that perhaps our, the job of architects uh, could be to kind of um, design new forms of architectural graph paper that kind of insinuate uh, rather than insist upon new ways of living and kind of interacting with each other. Um, so we collected a bunch of our plans together, um, some of our own projects from buildings and uh, own projects and others from uh, buildings that we had um, kind of studied deeply and just tried to construct an idea about, um, about this idea of kind of almost empty architecture. Um, something that could be kind of uh, relaxed but assertive at the same time. Um, and that despite its kind of straightforward plainness, um, nonetheless had these kind of rich implications for a kind of atmosphere constructed within its boundaries. So um, these two publications taken together can maybe be read as a way of kind of thinking about um, emptiness, whether in the city or in the design of a building, as something that's really kind of um, in our minds ripe with possibility that the you know the boundary of a park, parking lot or the perimeter of a space or, or a building can start to have implications for what happens inside um, and that the relationship between them isn't necessarily one-to-one -one. Um, so even to the point where we might be able to start thinking uh, of the kind of multiple simultaneous actions that occur within a building or within a kind of urban space as a kind of architecture within themselves. Um, so uh, with all of this kind of in mind, we've uh, been kind of trying to think about architecture as a kind of format, as a kind of blank, a blank sheet of letter sized paper that becomes this kind of framework for a kind of multiplicity and simultaneity of actions. Um, uh, the actions of the people inside, the kind of programming, the kind of un unprogrammed programming that occurs every day, the activities. Um, so it's something that kind of seems, uh, produces things that seem simple on the surface, but then have effects um, that are not. So we've been kind of showing some snapshots of recent projects um, through all of this as a way of kind of introducing this idea. But for the rest of the uh, lecture, we're going to zero in on a few um, a few projects, uh, one in Chicago, um, two uh, in Providence, one of them currently on the boards, um, uh, that kind of show um, this kind of evolution of thinking in our working um, and you know how we start thinking about uh, kind of architecture and urbanism is something that um, evolves in tandem. So, hi. Um, so I'm going to talk about the first of these projects, a uh, project that Dietrich mentioned um, is called Chicago Horizon. Um, and I think this is a nice way to kind of get into this idea that Aaron talked about um, how architecture really tries, how some of these projects really try to create a very open-ended um, piece of the city. Um, and so this, this first one was for the Chicago Architecture Biennial. It's a collaboration actually with a structural engineer named Brett Schneider, who also teaches at RISD. Um, and it was for a competition, an open competition to basically design a little lakefront kiosk. Um, and we were interested in it because, you know, there was this kind of opportunity to think about a kiosk that really tries to dissolve into the city somehow to kind of dissolve the boundary between a piece of architecture and the kind of city at large. Um, and so we started, you know, with these kind of drawings, starting to think about a space um, where, you know, a lot of different types of things could happen. Um, a space that the public could enjoy and that wasn't just purely about a kind of commercial kiosk. 
um, right? That would kind of offer something back to the city um, in addition. And we had a very strong reaction to the brief of the competition. Basically, they were asking for a very small kind of 200 square foot kiosk. And we were kind of think, you know, looking at the numbers and we were kind of thinking, you know, is there a way to kind of make this actually a much more generous project, something that would be more open, um, something that would kind of give, again, as I said, try to give something back to the city in addition to having a kind of vendor space. Um, so we asked ourselves, you know, how generous can we be, um, can a kiosk be? And um, one of the things that we, we had been thinking about, we had been working a lot with Mass Timber, which is, you know, you know, a series of um, kind of new uh, timber products that are on the American market today um, that uh, are very interesting because they, uh, you know, they're supposed to be more sustainable than concrete or steel, um, but they're also very strong materials. And so we were interested in thinking about how could this pavilion maybe use some of these new mass timber technologies to, to make something more expansive. Um, so this was like kind of like early concept model uh, to think about like a really large roof, a really large wood roof um, that basically would frame a kind of public space underneath, um, but also serve, you know, as you kind of ascend up a series of steps as a way to kind of look back on the city as well. Um, and so, you know, we we're, you know, as we were thinking about how do you kind of go from something so small to something much larger, um, we kind of had to be very simple about the whole thing, right? So just like a really large roof um, supported on 13 columns and this insistence that the public would also kind of play a part in the project and kind of fill in the blank, let's say, of the project. Um, so this is, the, this is the floor plan of the project. Again, trying to keep it very simple and open. Um, so uh, with just these kind of two small volumes underneath the big square roof. Um, and a series of these 13 uh, funny columns, which I'll talk more about underneath. Um, and in order to make this kind of leap in scale, right, to go from a small kiosk to something much larger, given the budget and constraints of the competition, we thought we would work with relatively cheap, um, but industrial materials. So mass timber is what you see on the left here. This is a slab of what's called cross laminated timber. Um, and then on the right, just, chain link, just kind of everyday chain link fence. Um, and, and try to leverage these two very ordinary materials and use them in a kind of special way in this project. Um, so you, see, you start to see that working here on the inside. Uh, so that roof slab is the kind of structural CLT um, timber slab. And um, basically trying to find a, a way or an expression for the material that would keep the pavilion as light and as abstract as possible. And also to try to maximize the space between the columns, have them be as far apart um, as possible. So this is a very, um, in a way, we started out in a very conceptual way with this idea of kind of dissolving the kiosk into, into the city, but it also became a kind of technical problem very quickly. And, and we were very lucky to work with Brett who, who somehow figured out a way to make this roof work and to keep it very, very thin. Um, this just gives you a sense of some of the layers or some of the components coming together in the project. Um, so again, you know, trying to kind of keep that roof surface very minimal so that you don't see any beams or any kind of additional um, ornamentation, let's say on the surface, you're just looking at the kind of structure. Um, and then the chain link that I mentioned is basically what's being used to frame those lightweight volumes underneath the roof. Um, and we're essentially just stretching it between the roof and the ground in this case, uh, which, which allows you to keep those corners very, very light. Um, here's just some, maybe some pictures to, to round out this presentation, um, pictures of the pavilion here on Lake Michigan. And actually Dietrich's very nice that you visited. It's nice to, <laughs> that it's, it still gets um, a lot of people moving through it. Um, and then just a few more views of looking back to the city from the roof. Um, and maybe the other thing to mention is that, you know, as this pavilion transitions into the night, there's also a lighting installation um, at those two volumes underneath the roof that tries to activate it during the nighttime, uh, which you see here. Um, and so maybe just on this last image of the project, you know, we're really trying to think about the project as this kind of blank framework or graph paper, as Aaron mentioned. Um, that allows for a kind of simultaneity and a kind of multiplicity of things to occur there. That it's not kind of overly prescriptive, um, and uh, you know actions that aren't kind of predetermined by the architecture, but are instigated and kind of inflected by the by the building itself. 
um, I'll have, let you present Southlight. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is just jumping uh, actually back to the, the project that kind of um, uh, was the impetus for the vacant Providence um, uh, exhibition and, and publication. Um, and this, so this was done in 2016 and, and it was a project where we um, led a, a group of uh, RISD students from architecture, landscape architecture um, and interior design. Um, in the design and construction of a new performance space and um, public uh, garden in uh, on the south side of Providence. Um, this is uh, Trinity Square. Um, the, um, uh, the project is on the other side of these two buildings that you see here on the left is the Southside Cultural Center uh, of Rhode Island, um, uh, which is the uh, only cultural center in Rhode Island that's, um, that's led by and um, uh, on behalf of artists and, and uh, audiences and communities of color. Uh, on the right is the Trinity uh, United Methodist uh, Church. Um, and um, so it's a, it's a very kind of interesting kind of organization that the cultural center used to be the parish house for the church and um, they've since kind of split off and, and um, become their own operation, but they're very much kind of conjoined um, both in terms of their um, their operation and um, and in terms of just making the site work together. Um, this is that kind of parking uh, crater that I mentioned before, and it's um, it's really this kind of uh, at the time was this kind of acre and a half of just um, uh, deteriorating asphalt that was really just not used very much. And yet the cultural center was running programming out there in the summertime. They were doing events, performances under that, um, that tree, which was dying at the time and is now um, been removed. Um, um, but it really just was not hospitable to that kind of thing. So they, they kind of charged us with trying to figure out how to, how to make it work better for them. Um, and when we looked into the zoning for the site, it turned out that the kind of parking requirements for the building had recently um, been reduced significantly. So we were able to um, take this, this one and a half acre void and essentially cut it, uh, cut it in half. Um, and what we ended up with proposing was to kind of push the parking back from the building and create this um, strip connecting the two adjacent streets that would then become a kind of um, front lawn for the cultural center. Um, and of course, um, one question might be, why isn't the entrance on Trinity Square for the cultural center? And it's because it was the, the Sunday school for the church. So you would enter through the church, but you can't do that anymore. So they've kind of flipped everything around and everyone enters uh, through this very small door on the, the parking lot side. Um, so they really needed something that was a little bit more welcoming on that side. Um, the centerpiece of the space um, is this new performance pavilion um, that you can see here. Um, that would allow the center to kind of expand their offerings in the um, in the warmer months while also creating a kind of new revenue stream um, as a kind of rentable space for the, uh, the cultural center and then also for the neighborhood. Um, so this was a basically a zero budget uh, project. And so we had to work with within kind of existing standardized systems and kind of happened upon these kind of standardized greenhouse kits. Um, and the design of these is really kind of completely driven by, um, by the economy. It's all about kind of maximizing interior space and light for plants to grow and really minimizing kind of structure. And we figured that if we use the system as a base, we could very um, kind of cheaply and quickly um, construct um, a, a 25 by 50 building for, um, for the cultural center. So um, we made um, by kind of deep dive, uh, doing a deep dive into the construction system of this, we were able to kind of um, develop a couple modifications. One was to just flip the roof trusses upside down, um, essentially to, to make give the whole thing a, a, a little bit more volume on the interior, but then also um, give it a little bit more of a reading from the exterior that it wouldn't look so much like an agricultural shed. It might start to take on a kind of more civic uh, presence. Um, we also used a, a slightly kind of thicker, more translucent, higher quality uh, polycarbonate for the um, uh, for the cladding than you normally see on a, a greenhouse, which has this nice effect of um, creating this kind of Gaussian blur of the, uh, the space around it. Um, the final, uh, the third modification that we made was um, had to do with its perimeter. A lot of greenhouses you've probably seen have these 
very silly little residential doors on the side of these huge buildings. Um, so we had to really think about, you know, what do we do with the doors? And it seemed like we needed, because of the kind of different, many different types of performance and events that were anticipated to happen here, as well as the kind of connection to the lawn outside, we really need to be thinking about um, a more open boundary. Um, and so um, we, uh, we basically kind of um, came up with this idea in conversation with the cultural center of having doors that open up all the way around um, and just being able to maximize the flexibility of the space and then make that the outward expression of the building um, so that uh, it's not just that you have a very flexible space, but that you can kind of read its flexibility from, from the exterior. So um, here it is with the kind of doors installed in their uh, closed position. Um, and then when they kind of open up out onto the lawn. And then here from the exterior, um, where you can see this kind of, um, has this kind of monolithic ex uh, expression when it's uh, closed up. Um, then when it opens up, it really kind of stretches out into the landscape and kind of invites you in. Um, the landscape has this kind of large lawn area for events, but then is also bookended by these two gardens, um, which uh, we worked with a, a landscape architecture professor on um, to kind of specify local and native uh, perennials um, that kind of minimize maintenance, but then also create this really intense sense of lushness in, in summer when they're um, at their peak. Um, and then uh, between the pavilion and the landscape were very interesting idea that this uh, space could be seen as a kind of porous hole, that it wasn't like a landscape in a building, but it was a landscape that extends through a building. Um, and that it could really be kind of adopted by um, whoever is using it at the moment to whatever end they really uh, need to. Um, and so in that sense, to try and think about it as, as um, a, more of a kind of urban expression than just simply a building. Um, so um, what What's nice is that it's been able to kind of accommodate very large um, uh, events and festivals on behalf of the cultural center, um, as well as kind of smaller, um, smaller formal events, specialized performances, um, monthly tenant meetings, community meetings, that kind of thing. Um, and um, because of the kind of translucent nature of it, we were working with a, a really great uh, lighting designer named Electra Bordenaro. Um, and she came up with this idea of, of just using kind of simple fluorescent um, lights that would then kind of illuminate the space um, at night, but then also kind of make it glow um, outward uh, so that you can even kind of see it from the streets um, as you pass by. Um, and the project's been, been um, very good, I think, partly because the cultural center has really um, kind of taken ownership of it and has made great use of it. Their existing building is is somewhat dilapidated um, and uh, and is not um, wheelchair accessible. So this is their only accessible space. And also in COVID, it was kind of great. You can open up the doors, and um, they were able to host events when uh, without it, they would have been completely um, completely shut down. Um, but um, because of of the kind of success of this, um, the cultural center has asked us to kind of develop a vision to renovate their um, their main building and to really transform the interior into something that matches their, their mission. Um, and so this is a kind of view of what, we've, uh, what we're proposing for um, the exterior of the building, a new kind of elevator and entry addition that creates this kind of more welcoming um, entry into the building itself. Um, and then renovation of all the interior spaces. This is their kind of main auditorium. Um, really super interesting historic structure on there in, inside that we're planning to, um, to open up. So it's been very kind of exciting to see the way that um, design has kind of um, changed the way that the cultural center sees themselves and the kind of future that they have for themselves in, the, in that space. Um, but I'd also say that the kind of process of working with them both during the time that we did South Site, but also since has really kind of um, changed the way that we think and work um, with uh, with the community. So it's been a kind of symbiotic uh, evolution, which has been really, um, uh, I'd say super interesting and very enjoyable to be a part of. 
So the last project I'm going to talk about is a project that's close to our heart and probably uh, a space that many of you guys know very well. It's the um, looking at redesigning the central civic spaces in downtown Providence. Um, it's it, the project is for the city of Providence. Uh, we're part of a much larger team uh, led by Arup, um, the engineering firm. Uh, we're working with Stimson Landscape Architecture. Um, we're also working with Mar Marissa Brown, who I'm sure some of you guys know here from Brown University. Um, and then Manuel Cordero uh, has been helping with the kind of community engagement on the process. And where we are at now with the project is that we just finished, or in June, we finished 30% design, design. And really what the project is, is looking at, uh, what the city is trying to do is to look at a series of kind of public spaces downtown so including the river walks and Kennedy Plaza and the two parks, Biltmore Park and Burnside Park, and try to think about um, you know, how these, this collection of spaces could form a kind of cohesive kind of public center for the city. Um, of course, you know, this project started last year in 2020, uh, you know, amidst the kind of national reckoning with systemic racism. And I think that's that was a kind of um, Thing that was really on our minds as we started this project, you know, Providence is a very diverse city, um, and how do we kind of think about a city center that would start to invite um, people from all over the, the city to come and be in this space? Um, and it's also a question of like, what are the, who are the voices? Um, you know, which voices have been historically absent, and how do we kind of welcome those also into the center? So it's a complicated project. I'm sure presenting this here is opening a can of worms, but I'm very, actually very curious to hear what you guys think since you guys all know the city very well. And, um, and um, but maybe to start out with, you know, our office uh, really focused on, on the Kennedy Plaza site. So the river walks, um, that's a very kind of technical issue um, having to do with rising sea levels. Um, but, and the landscape architect was really focused on that area. Our office was really kind of thinking about the public space around Kennedy Plaza. And um, it's interesting, um, really interesting site. You know, historically it's been a site for transit. Um, it was the kind of plaza for the train station in the city. Um, and now of course it's a kind of central bus hub um, for the city. Um, the state has a plan to move buses out of Kennedy Plaza, which of course is a very kind of explosive topic. And, um, but we're trying to figure out, you know, what happens then in its place? You know, what does this space become for the, for the citizens of, of the city? Um, and, you know, it's been the space of transit, but at certain moments in the city's history, it's also been this incredible space where the city can really get together because it is such a large open space. Um, and, you know, this is, I love this slide. This is an image of uh, Kennedy Plaza where that red circle has the magician Houdini performing. And, you know, you have this huge crowd and it just made us think, you know, how can this space again, you know, be as a space where the city can kind of come together. And, um, and so we think that, you know, there's an opportunity to really think about the plaza um, or really kind of reconsider what that means for the 21st century. Um, and right now, you know, the Kennedy Plaza has all these objects kind of scattered across the plaza. Uh, it has all the buses, it's very noisy. Um, it's typically not a place that you would want to just go and hang out and kind of sit down. And so what are the things that might start to activate that space? Um, how can we allow many simultaneous things to happen there? It's a large space. It doesn't have to be a kind of singularity. Um, how can we make it immersive? So something that kind of connects us to the broader landscapes and communities of Rhode Island. Um, and finally, how do you kind of keep it active and lively on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so just a kind of aerial photograph of the area we're talking about. So you have Kennedy Plaza at the bottom, uh, Burnside and Biltmore Parks across the street, and of course the ice rink that's there currently. And um, you know one of the issues currently in trying to kind of conceive this as a kind of cohesive space is that Washington Street kind of cuts across it, and it's a very busy street. Um, and so one of the proposals actually is to pedestrianize that area and to kind of unify um, the mm -hmm. plaza with the kind of adjoining parks, which are kind of underused currently. And I think could um, are, you know, it, there's a kind of benefit to kind of creating this larger pedestrian zone that's also quieter because the buses are now at the periphery of that area. And um, 
And so, yeah, I think there's this incredible opportunity to kind of open up the plaza as a civic space. You know, we can make it more expansive, uh, it can be quieter. And I think we can really start to imagine it becoming the kind of heart of the city. Um, we, you know, in thinking about this, it's about opening up the plaza, but it's also about, you know, if there are, if there are architectural elements that those would have a very light touch because obviously this is a space that is surrounded by incredible historic buildings um, so how can you start to suggest an architecture or a way of making spaces that doesn't um, try to kind of compete with, with what's already there? Um, and then one of the things that the team has proposed is to actually move the ice rink to the heart of Kennedy Plaza so that, you know, you can, in the wintertime, you'd be able to kind of skate and be surrounded by the kind of historic facades. Um, and also to think about the space in front of City Hall, where there's currently the monument, it's a very kind of congested space. How can that really become the front yard for City Hall, a kind of interface with that building, um, but also a space where you can gather and um, have demonstrations at certain times. Um, and then there are a few kind of architectural elements, um, including this kind of large shading structure um, that's really kind of infrastructural piece. You know, it's a space of relief from the harsh sun in the summertime. Um, also, you know, a kind of shelter uh, from the rain and snow in the winter, um, but also a space that might have kind of um, a set of amenities for the public and social services, um, but also an infrastructure for performances that could really start to take over the whole plaza. Um, but, you know, the, that's a set of, um, elements, but I think to go back to this question of how do you really unify the set of spaces um, into a kind of coherent role, we've been kind of developing a kind of unifying spatial language. And we've been thinking about this kind of concept of islands scattered across the site, um, islands that basically provide some kind of relief from the kind of openness of the plaza. Um, it's a kind of slower space where you can sit down and gather um, and each one of these islands would allow for a kind of concentrated material and programmatic intensity, um, but while at the same time allowing the rest of the plaza to be more open-ended, because I think it's important that we don't just kind of fill the plaza with a bunch of stuff um, that doesn't allow for the kind of large public gatherings that we imagine could actually happen here. Um, so these islands that you see in these model photographs uh, would house basic amenities. So they would provide shade, they would have benches, but they would also have services and food. Um, but there are also these kind of lush landscape environments that you can, you'd be able to see from afar. And they, their intention is to really make the plaza softer and more welcoming. Um, they also start to introduce a subtle, topo subtle topographical shifts into the expanse of the plaza. So while most of the plaza is flat, they might start to kind of um, dip up um, and all of the islands that you see, you know, we're kind of cycling through them have some sort of seating and vegetation. So, but each has its own character. So each island has a kind of rich mater materiality. So there's an island made of granite um, that houses a monument. Another is a kind of soundscape, um, a brick folly, an outdoor classroom, a meadow, or just a kind of eddy for people watching as, you know, if you want to just kind of watch people moving across the plaza. Um, and some of these islands, you know, we would propose to have some lightweight shading structures and public furniture um, that try to kind of merge the landscape with the architecture. Um, but I think they were also interesting to us because they're a way of maybe um, amending the kind of predominant axis of the space. You know, Kennedy Plaza is so centrally planned and um, it's a way of maybe starting to re reframe some of the historic elements on the site. Um, so for example, the Soldiers and Sailors Monument is, is in this scheme uh, moved off the axis of the plaza and recontextualized. And the idea is to complement it by other narratives, new narratives by, with public art um, that comes out you know, today. And maybe just to end the, on this slide, I think the intention um, is to really think about what are the voices that have been kind of historically missing in this space and how can design bring those into the public realm. Um, I think we'll end here, but again, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this project in particular, but also all the projects. And um, thank you. So we look forward to some questions.
questions from the audience. Hi, thank you. First of all, um, I was just wondering, you guys have been speaking a lot about uh, kind of the communities in which you're designing um, and talking to them. And I'm wondering what kind of strategies you use for community engagement and like methods that you found to be helpful. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think uh, it's a good question. We've um, we've learned a lot along the way. I would say we started out by just doing the things that we were trained to do, and I will say that they did not work. Um, <laughs> um, and those had to do with um, you know trying to do like polished presentations and everything else. The Southlight project, in particular, um, we had a number of proposals um, rejected. Um, not necessarily because of the design work, but just because of the way the conversation was constructed. Some of that um, had to do with the, the politics of the neighborhood and not with us, but some of it also had to do with us. We were going in there from, um, you know, we're, we're well-educated. We, um, we, uh, we were working with RISD students at the time. So we we're kind of showing up and seeing like, this is something that we're, um, that we produced for you and and people said you didn't produce it for me um, <laughs> uh, so I don't know who you're talking about um, after after going through a, a couple um, steps like that we realized we were we were trying to design too much and not listen enough and I think um, we ended up going back for a third bite at the apple um, and uh, showed up instead of with any design we showed up with a site plan with a big purple dot on it and we just said what what do you guys want to see on this purple dot and then that really opened up a really interesting conversation we were um we were very exhausted by the process at that moment so we were thinking well we'll probably put some benches out there or something and the community said no we need a enclosed performance space we need to be able to you know enjoy this space year round etc so a lot of ideas came out of that process that then we were able to go back with our skills as designers produce something and and show it to them and say this is what what you asked for this is what you kind of contributed to this project so there was a kind of realization that the these community processes are often perfunctory. They really need to be much more kind of dialogical. Um, and that's, um, I think there's there's limitations to any community process, but I think going in with a kind of much, um, much more open slate um, for people to contribute to is a really important, um, important strategy for that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to follow on that, it's easier for me to understand the south side project because you've got a more limited set of constituents mm -hmm. and, and an environment but a project like the downtown province one i mean you've got this half a million people who probably would have an interest in that so how do you know that the people that you're talking to or engaging with are representative of, of the community yeah that was a definitely a complicated process and that's why we work with um, manuel cadero who does this for a living i think yeah um, because we wouldn't have been able to really figure out how to do that but i think um there there were a number of community meetings i think the other thing that manuel did that was very smart was to actually reach out to specific communities like for example we did some presentations at some of the high schools around um around town because you know a lot of a lot of the space especially even with the buses in downtown is used by teens and teens are like the last people to show up at these community meetings and so I think um, being, I think being proactive about searching out some of these communities is, is key. Um, but you're right. I think it is really difficult because you know we we had a number of community meetings, and it doesn't always feel like we're reaching everybody. Right? Not everybody has the time to show up to these meetings. Not everybody can can afford to, or you know, people have complicated lives and. Um, so I think it's it's a real struggle. So you know, there's a, a couple of strategy. You know, there were community meetings. There was also a website where people could put input. Manuel also talked to people right on the site, like people that are actually just currently using um, Kennedy Plaza. Um, yeah, that was all. Um, I mean, Manuel yeah. deserves all the credit yeah. for that. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's. I think we also um in that context in particular we have to say like look design can only do so much a lot of what's driving 
um, what's going on in downtown Providence is, is um, you know, politics at state level and city level that we have no um, no real influence on. So, but the community um, process is important, uh, not just so that we as designers can reflect back what people are saying to us, but also so that those um, the people who are in control of those kind of political processes and issues can can hear them and potentially respond to them. I think you know the the bus um, the bus hub issue was a big explosive part of the project. We were just following on you know the state's plan. So I think the city was trying to figure out what do you, what do you uh, what do you do this with this space when it's not transit anymore? We can't just leave it empty. We have to, to we, we have to take this opportunity to do something with it. But a lot of the feedback was, you know, what about transportation? And I think what's um, that has led to, I think RIDOT has kind of put a pause on their multi-hub plan now. Some um, some groups downtown have come up with an alternative plan, which seems very promising to kind of consolidate the buses into one uh, one building. Uh, we'll see where that goes. But I think that. Um, like the community process is important, but not just for design. Does that make sense? Like, mm -hmm. I, I do think that there's a there's a parallel kind of set of actions that are, are taking place that are really important to what happens in Kennedy Plaza, um, but don't the design is not going to reflect that. So well, it's only a complicated, yeah, <laughs> complicated process. But but I was thinking when we were talking about people who how people who are use the space there. I don't ever go to Kennedy Plaza because there's nothing in it for me. But if it were better, I would. I live a mile away. You know, it's not, but it's, but I'm not going there now. So I'm not somebody who's engaging with the space currently. And so how do you reach that audience? You know, I mean, because there's potentially new audiences um, if you, if you build it. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, I think that's definitely um, the intention. We did get, I mean, the, the big community meetings, we got a lot of, um, we got a lot of feedback around that like what do people want to see there what, what would attract them into that Good. space so that was really helpful i mean one of the, the great challenges about this site is of course that uh, candy Plaza is facing north and the sun is blocked pretty much all day long by the high rises mm -hmm. on the southern edge so sun is one of the great uh, magnets for people, right? Especially in a place like Rhode Island where we don't have too much of it. Then. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges, right? To create life in a place that is shady, basically throughout the year and through every single day because the high rises block all the sunlight. I think that's always going to be a big, big steep challenge for any zone in any place. It's much better if one goes up the hill to mm -hmm. the stretch of street in front of uh, Union the old union station right but I, I can imagine that that's really one of the key challenges i guess right um, yeah um special yeah, measures yeah. that have in mind that to bring more life into the space. so the project lead is arab which is this big engineering company and they they actually ran um a pretty in-depth comfort analysis on on the site to try and figure out like how do we how do we just make it more comfortable um, so that actually led to a lot of the things that, that you see, even though it's not kind of explicit, but I think like just in, uh, the, one of the biggest issues aside from sun is just wind, like the, that wind wall of so <laughs> that wall of tall buildings actually takes those northern winter winds and pulls them right down into the site. <laughs> um, and so, um, so uh, we had to kind of organize the whole um, planting strategy around that. Uh, eventuality. So creating these moments of shelter, essentially. Yep. Do you think that the decline of Providence Place Mall complicated your effort to do something downtown Providence? Um, I, well, it, is it in decline? I'm not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. The big, the big stores have left. But, yeah. Um, but the uh, you know crazy barrel is left on yeah room. i don't know i i when i do go there it's so crowded that i can't even move <laughs> um so it, i don't know if it's that type of store or what but in, in a way i think any any decline there i don't know 
whether the impact would be positive or negative on Kennedy Plaza, it certainly wasn't a, a problem that we saw, um, except that we had to figure out there's always people trying to get up to the mall, but they're crossing very dangerous streets to get up there. So there's a lot of kind of pedestrian safety stuff. Um, but I, um, we are trying to figure out how do we, how do we grab some of that audience, I think, and how do we get more people into, into Kennedy Plaza. Well, one reason why I say that in the Garden City is one experience. It would probably take some more than one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd much rather have people downtown than in the mall, but that's <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so I perform with the Progress and Proud group a guild oh, and, uh, for a period of like over two years. I went to the Southside Coconut Center at least once a week. And I nobody, um, at least in that community, ever knew what that building was uh, that was over on the side. Um, so it's really interesting to be able to put a name to, I guess, the building I have seen many, many times. So since um, you lived in Progress as well, um, I'm just Curious, did your sort of hopes and ambitions for that building come true? I mean, I think it's it's you know the cultural center. I'm sure you're aware is a very resource limited organization, okay. um, and so they um, they they just kind of struggle to keep things moving on a day to day basis. Um, our interactions with the leadership there and from what we've seen of events that they've organized and everything um, make it seem like they that they they see value there and they make use of it. There's certainly a number of events there. They've been able to get some revenue out of it. So I think that's uh, that's important. Obviously, um, there's like um, just basic day-to-day -day operation stuff that they, they need to um, and figure out how to how to fund and everything, but I think it has been um, from from everything that we've seen, it's been pretty successful for them. We've been involved in projects where there isn't like an organization attached to something like this, and and it's you kind of end up wondering like what's this what's this thing for? And I think we've been lucky that the cultural center has really kind of bought into it. I don't know if, if the improv. Guild. It sounds like the Improv Guild hasn't had the opportunity to make use of it. Yeah, so that. to my knowledge, um, the Mulberry Theater group moved out of that building for your show, and the Improv Group has also moved out. Oh, the Improv Group has. Yeah, we've, we've never put yes. on in that yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been to events there, so I don't. Um, but not Providence Improv Guild <laughs> events. <so. laughs> yep. Um, so just along the lines of the South Side, I'll talk about the South Side Cultural Center. Uh, there are some very vibrant cultural organizations representing um, different people and heritages. So the, um, the Ocean um, Beauty Center, uh, the uh, Rhode Island Rock Storytellers, Rhode Island Latino Arts still has a space there, even though they're downtown headquartered in Central Falls. What's interesting about that place to me is both um, tragic and but full of possibility. That building has an incredible history, um, starting in the mid 19th century, and then at, you know as the space that was functioning as a essentially a cultural center, even though that you get you know attached to the church, but it's also the gateway. Where it is is the gateway to the South Side. And the fact that it's a cultural center functioning as this gateway, I think, sends a really amazing message to what Providence could be as it changes so dramatically in terms of its demographics, especially there. I mean, Providence is now 40% Latinx, and that's, I mean, that area is the, you know, the, the heart. And so, and what's tragic about it to me is that is the lack of investment why i mean i think that so i think that um south like did it, it was it wasn't just about a space for the building and for the community it was also a space for the neighborhood and for like i live over there 
So every time I go down, um, what is the name? Bridge of, yeah. Bridge of, yeah. you know, and I, at night, and I see South Light lit up, right, as you're getting to that really complicated intersection, it's like a beacon of hope, you know? And, but why, and, and that sort of, that project to me was like the, the step, the stuff that, that could show how investment could really do something amazing, but yet it doesn't happen. I mean, that building needs like $25 million to on it. Yeah, not quite that much. We had a cost testing with them, but, <laughs> but it, need, it needs yeah. a lot of it needs a lot of money. Um, and, and, and it's so, but it's such a it's such an amazing place. Yeah, yeah, really yeah I I I couldn't agree more. I mean, that not just the cultural center, but the neighborhood in general. The 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 lack of investment is is really heartbreaking, and also the kind of destination of the. The neighborhood by like drive-through restaurants and things like that i think like very poor planning decisions that didn't see value there in the past um we're optimistic and the cultural center is optimistic that they're at a moment where they think they can um they can turn that around so that's why we've been working with them on um developing a plan for that renovation so that they can go out and and raise money around it um, yeah, we all have our fingers crossed. And if anyone wants to donate, <laughs> anyone has deep pockets, <laughs> uh, we can connect you to them. They're very deserving. It's a really super interesting organization. Okay. Chicago, Chicago Horizon. Um, I don't know if What happened to the kiosk part? There was, you mean, how does it work? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. You know. I mean, it, it looks like an amazing space and very inviting and, and lots of opportunities to see this way and, and open everything up. Um, my concept of kiosk is it's, it's some place where there's public information. Is it on all those columns? I mean, no, I think it's a, it's a really good question. So the context for the project was for this biennial that basically comes to Chicago every two years. And so it's a, in, in a sense a problematic setup, right? Because the pavilion was built for the inaugural biennial and to, to kind of, um, you know, kind of draw attention to the city and to the biennial, but it never really had the kind of um, community or ownership uh, that kind of stays with it. And so the, over the years, there have been like pop-ups, um, you know, people have been kind of uh, selling food as pop-ups out of that space. Um, but it's never had a kind of continuous uh, stewardship over the years. And so uh, it's very different than like, let's say the case with Southlight where there's a kind of community or a community center that kind of takes care of the thing. Um, Chicago is a very different story in the sense that it was built, it was meant to be temporary. It's still there, but it doesn't have the same kind of, let's say love from a community in, in a way that- um, have a community. Yeah, yeah, it's but, odd. But yeah. I think in a way that like to speak to the design question, like in a way it's, it was good that it didn't, um, that it's not a conventional kiosk. Like I, I, the kiosk that we're talking, is, uh, or that they were looking for was something where they could sell, yeah, coffee or hot dogs or whatever, um, a solid box. Yeah, it's so like some, Harvard Square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, right. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. So, but, right. but, I mean, you know, you get the picture, but, but I'm thinking, wow, really interesting, but was it ever used? Or did it ever catch on? And the answer is no. Yeah, and they never programmed it. So it was, I mean, but in, in a way it's, because it's very open, it then took on this other function. You go out there in, in the summertime and people are sitting under there enjoying the view and enjoying the shade. And there were a couple other kiosks built uh, for the same biennial um, that were more of these closed boxes also didn't get programmed, even though they were, may have appeared to function better as kiosks because the park district is busy and doesn't have time to figure those things out or whatever. Um, and so those ones are are more like these objects rather than the spaces now, so. Thanks. So uh, I have three announcements. Uh, first, of course, uh, I think this is a good moment to continue the uh, discussion in a, small, in a more sort of intimate way over wine and food with our uh, speakers. So my three announcements are I wanted to thank Bridget 
and then Reese, who Reese, you're at the door and Bridget has opened nice stuff up behind the scenes and has made sure the wine is chilled and the food is out there. So this is great. Second, uh, we have opened our gallery now. Uh, many of you probably don't even know that we have an amazing art gallery right behind this wall. You can go there and check it out. There's a great exhibition about uh, photography about Sinaloa in Mexico. Very impressive. Um, and then I wanted to, uh, before I think our speakers, I wanted to say that you can several architects and architects and uh, um, artists and architects and thinkers. And next week we'll have a uh, composer and music professor who happens to be here, Eric Nathan, who will show some of his recent compositions and then uh, first here, and then uh, we'll move to the music room and we might talk him into playing a little more on the Stanger piano. So, <laughs> so uh, please come back for next week. And I just want to say this was terrific. And I must say, looking at your work, I suddenly realized how important that term ultramodern is because you basically pick the best elements of modern architecture, the transparency and the lightweight structure and the social relevance and put it in a sort of heightened form into your work. And I thought it was really convincing and wonderful stuff. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.